How are you? What's happening today? Well done. <laughs> Apparently, there's also a football game, which will pass like dust in the wind. But the word of the Lord remains forever. Amen? Let's open it together. We're going to begin a new series this morning. We're going to be studying through, working through the letter of James. So if you would, please open your Bibles or your Bible apps. Turn to, scroll to James chapter 1. Read with me what he's written beginning with chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, Greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flower falls, and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. This is the word of the Lord. Amen, church? How many of you have ever asked yourself the following questions? What do I do now? How do I... Move forward. What do I say next? Where do I go from here? How do I make this decision? Have you ever asked questions like that? With introspective self-dialogue? I think that what each of us really wants, I think what each of us really needs, is a faith that is practical. A faith that works in our everyday lives. Does that make sense? Well, this is the kind of faith that James describes in this letter. It's the same faith that Paul describes. It's the same faith that Peter describes. It's the same faith that's called out by all the various biblical authors. But James, in this letter, is rich in the practical. His letter is very much boots-on-the-ground Christianity. This letter, as we will work through it, just kind of spills over with everyday wisdom. I think that as we read through James, what we're going to find is that he gives to us as Christians today wisdom on the way as we continue to walk after Jesus. Something we should know about James. He was Jesus' half-brother. But James in this letter doesn't present to us a Jesus from the perspective of a sibling or a sibling rivalry. Rather, he presents to us a Jesus who is the risen Lord of the universe and a Jesus who is simultaneously deeply concerned with our day-to-day. Throughout the letter, James is going to teach us quite a few things about Jesus and about what it means to follow Jesus. But the first thing that James is going to teach us about Jesus is this. Jesus redeems my suffering. Jesus redeems my suffering. Look again at what he writes in verses 2, 3, and 4. He says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Is life hard? I think we all know that life presents to us a vast array of difficulties and disappointments. I'm willing to wager that most of us here this morning are facing real challenges right now. Now, I just want to point out 
that James, uh, maybe because he was the brother of Jesus, uh, was a bold man. Look at how he comes out of the gate in the beginning of this passage. Imagine for you know, the sake of example that you're really going through it and you come to me for some pastoral care and counseling. Your soul is heavy, um, your spirit is grieved, you're heavy laden, you're worn down from a particular trial that you have been living through. And maybe that's just it, right? You've just kind of been living through it. You're just surviving, not even thriving. But suppose you come to me and you say, Mike, I'm going through this very difficult thing in my life, and suddenly I cut you off and I explain, well, praise God. <laughs> praise God. Count it all joy, brother. <laughs> Count it all joy, sister, that you're facing this difficulty. Would that strike you as particularly pastoral and sensitive? I think that we can read these opening verses and they can like, at least at first glance, have this effect. They can feel abrupt, almost insensitive. But I want to suggest that James is anything but insensitive here. On the contrary, he knows that of all the times in life when we would need a practical faith, it is when we experience trials. Because as we would all agree, trials are by nature unpleasant. And so it's not because James is insensitive here that he gives this command, but because he's deeply sensitive. He understands our weakness. He understands human nature. And he knows that joy is not our natural response to hardship. Now I want to quickly point out something that's so obvious we could just miss it. James does not say, count it all happiness when you meet trials. Rather, he says, count it all joy when you meet trials. James doesn't use the Greek word here, which describes happiness, which is on account of circumstances or privilege, but rather, the Greek word that he uses here in this command is a word which denotes joy, or it speaks of the experience of gladness, no matter your circumstances. I think that he's pointing us to something different from what we tend to cling to in our culture today and in modern living, which is happiness. He's pointing us to something that kind of transcends our circumstances and our everyday experience. He says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you face trials of various kinds. So this thing that he's talking about isn't some kind of passing feeling that we have to, you know, dig deep and muster up and try to produce inside of ourselves. Because joy is not a feeling, it's a fruit. It's something that's supplied by the inner working of the Holy Spirit. It's given by God and it's found by looking to God. Paul says to the Galatians, but the fruit of the Spirit is love joy, peace, and so on. But even more, like, joy is something you can do. You can rejoice, right? Think about what Peter writes in his first letter. He says, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So again, James knows that joy is not our natural response to hardship. It's not our natural response to trials. It is not our natural response to suffering. And that's why he gives this command here to count it all joy, to consider it all joy, to reckon it all joy when we face trials. James is saying to us that we need to actually actively, not passively, but actively re-examine our trials and kind of process our trials through the lens of who God has revealed himself to be in the scriptures. We need to kind of reconsider, rethink our trials as we experience them and contextualize them in the greater context of God's redemptive purposes that are present in our lives. 
James is not saying that our trials and that our sufferings and our hardships are good in and of themselves. What he is saying is that we can and we should actually face these things with joy because of what God will redemptively accomplish through them. Look back at what he says in verse 1 when he greets uh, the people he's writing to. He says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to notice those words, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not kind of merely a formality that he's supplying in the opening. He's not just kind of formally identifying Jesus as Lord because that's what you do at the beginning of a letter. He's identifying Jesus as Lord because Jesus is Lord and because he's immediately going to turn his attention to the subject of trials. Do you know what the earliest Christian creed was? In the early church, the first formalized Christian creed was simply this. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And what that means is that Jesus has risen and Jesus is reigning. And Jesus will rule forever. That's what Jesus is Lord means. Jesus is Lord over everything. He is Lord over creation. He is Lord over history. He will bring history to his prescribed end. He is Lord over politics. He is Lord over tyrants and despots and nations and empires. Jesus is Lord over the future. Jesus is Lord over your life whether you acknowledge it or not. Jesus is Lord over your circumstances and even over your sufferings. And because Jesus is Lord, even over your trials, even over your suffering, James is saying that you must, not can, not could, not even should, but that you must live with the expectation that as a Christian man or woman, Jesus is redeeming your suffering. Because he's Lord. He is taking the trials that continually come your way, and he is turning them around, and he is using those trials to shape you, and to form you, and to mold you, and to mature you, and to sanctify you, and to build you into the man or to the woman that he intends for you to become and with this knowledge of his goodness we can actually count it all joy when we face trials look at verses three through four james says for you know for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete lacking in nothing Look at what James is promising here. He's promising almost paradoxically um, that God uses the trials in our lives, those things in our lives, those experiences, those hardships, those sufferings that we immediately think is kind of life-saturating, life-robbing, life-taking. He's using those things as pavers along the way to a destination where we will be perfect where we will be complete, where we will be lacking in nothing. And almost all of us have read this passage before, right? How many of you have read this passage before? Many of us have read it many times. Some of us have even memorized it. And here's the thing. I think that we can get so stunned by the command on the front end of this passage to consider it pure joy when we face trials that we actually miss the glory of the back end that we will be perfect and complete and lacking in nothing. Can you imagine what it will be like to lack for nothing? Let's think about those words for a minute. Lack nothing. What do you lack now? I wonder how many of the trials that are kind of collectively represented in this room right now have to do with a lack of something. It could be a lack of food or lack of home. 
a lack of safety, a lack of help, maybe a lack of means or money, security, resources, meaningful friendship or companionship. Maybe you lack confidence or knowledge. Maybe you lack purpose. Maybe you lack wisdom. Maybe your life lacks stability on a number of fronts. Maybe you wake up in the morning or you lay your head down at night and you lack peace or hope, faith, or love. We could go on and on, right? James says that we can count as joy the trials that we face now because God is redeeming them one by one, moment by moment, in order to bring us to a place in the future where we will lack nothing. Nothing at all. There will actually be a time for those of us who truly belong to Christ where we will be made complete and even perfect, he says. The word that James uses uh, that's translated perfect in our English translation pertains to meeting the very highest standard. It's, it's the, the, the zenith, the pinnacle, the acme of goodness. And for the Christian, that's our promise. Our promise is that that will be our future guaranteed forever and ever. Does that sound good? Notice what James says in verse 3. He says, the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. What is steadfastness? This is like the capacity to, to hold out, to hang on, to bear up in the face of difficulty. And steadfastness has built into it the ideas of patience, of endurance, of fortitude, perseverance. God is using your trials, whatever they are that you're going through right now, to produce inside of you this quality of steadfastness. And what is the eventual outcome of this quality continually being fortified in you as God works through your difficulties? James says, and let steadfastness have its full effect. Full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. I know what some of you are thinking right now. Oh, okay, you know. I'm sure that's the case for that other person's trials over there. But I don't really see how God could possibly be redeeming my trials that way. But James says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Do you see that? Of various kinds. In other words, church, God's work of redemption is not constrained to only some trials. You know, the special kind of trials that your friend has experienced, but not the kinds of trials that you're experiencing. It's not the case that there's this special class of trials that yours don't happen to fall into, that only those trials are subject to God's working through. When James says trials of various kinds, he means all the various trials that we experience on this side of Jesus' return. He means the set of all the diverse and varied and different and assorted hardships and sufferings and challenges that this life throws at us. And it throws many at us, does it not? And so I want to know, I want to ask you, what hardship is the enemy leveraging to try and undermine your faith right now? What difficulty is the devil using to tempt you to accuse God? What failure in your life are you tempted to believe has irredeemably, irrevocably ruined your life? What trial are you experiencing right now? Is it cancer? some other disease or sickness or malady? Do you have a trial in your marriage with your kids? Something going on with your job? Are you lonely, poor? Maybe you've experienced the death of a loved one. Maybe you've been estranged from somebody close to you. Many of us here are facing serious trials, amen? Amen. And life throws at us serious sufferings, does it not? Maybe even you're dealing with the consequences of your own sin. 
the good news is that you repent and God will redeem. But if that's you, then I want to encourage you, friend, to take heart. Because God will not waste your hurt. There's no waste in his economy. James says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. One pastor who I admire said of this verse that the joy that James commends to us here is the quiet, strong, constant feeding into the soul a deep satisfaction of knowing there is a sovereign God who spends our sorrows carefully and well. It's the joy of really, truly, actually, deeply believing Romans 8.28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. All things, amen? Not some things, not a few things, in all things. I think some of the sweetest words in all of Scripture come from Jesus in John 16. He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Jesus is Lord. Amen. My friends, think for a moment about that trial you are facing. God is not distant. He is not disinterested. He is not disconnected from your troubles. He is not dissatisfied, discontented, or disabused with you. If you are in Christ, friend, then God is present in your difficulty. He is near to you. And no matter what you are facing, no matter what you are enduring, He is working. And one day, I promise you, because James has promised you, he will see to it by his power that you lack nothing. Pastor Zach is kind of famous for saying a number of things. (laughs) One of which is this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall lack nothing. Do you know why that is true? Because Jesus redeems my suffering. Next, Jesus gives me wisdom. Look at the next paragraph, beginning in verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. That person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So we just saw that James commanded us in verse 2 to consider it all joy when we face trials. Would you agree with me that we see now that we are to do that? You with me? That, that is the path ahead of us. I think the next and obvious question is, how do we do that? Right? Like you're in the midst of something right now, and you're like, okay, yep, I'm tracking with you, but how do I get there? Right? And the answer is very simple. You want to know how you get there? You ask for help. When we are going through trials, what we need is help. Look again at what James says in verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. He promises us that we will lack nothing one day, and then he immediately turns his attention to what we need when we're going through it, and that is wisdom. And he says, if you lack that thing, if you lack wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. What is wisdom? Wisdom is a God-given and God-centered discernment about the practical matters or the practical issues in life. And so to receive wisdom from God is to receive very practical help in our day-to-day lives. How many of you guys have heard this kind of cultural proverb? Give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach him how to fish and you feed him for a what? Lifetime. Lifetime, That's not biblical, but it's insightful. 
I think that when we're going through difficulties, sometimes we plead with God to just take the difficulty away. Lord, take this trial away. How many of you have prayed that? I have. But notice that James doesn't encourage us in that direction, right? James doesn't encourage us to ask God to remove our trials, but to ask God for wisdom. Now, first of all, as James has just made clear, God uses our trials redemptively so that eventually, in the fullness of time, we will be made perfect in the final day when Jesus returns. And so if God were to simply answer that request and remove our trials, then he would be short-circuiting, he would be removing the very mechanisms that he has providentially chosen to work through to refine us. But even more, if God simply takes our present trial away, well, guess what? A future trial is sure to come. And if he takes this one away, we'll be no better equipped, prepared, battle-hardened to deal with that one when it comes. But as we humble ourselves under God's mighty hand, as we seek and receive wisdom, help from above, as we learn to lean into our storms, armed with the wisdom that the Lord freely and generously makes available to us, we will not only receive what we need to persist patiently through our present trial, but we will also grow in our continued confidence in God, not in ourselves, And in our reliance on his freely and constantly and faithfully available resources so that we will not be smashed by the next trial. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given him. I heard someone say of this verse that God more desires to give us wisdom than we desire to ask of it. Have you ever thought of that? As a Christian minister, people are regularly asking me to kind of pray for this situation or pray for that situation. And I I love to pray with you. I love to pray with people. Um, And what I do, the first thing that I generally pray for is that God would give you wisdom in the spirit of this verse. Now I want you to see there's a great encouragement built into this verse. First of all, James says that God gives wisdom generously. Okay, here's what's significant about that. Um, this means that God is eager to give us wisdom. And God doesn't give us wisdom only when we kind of compel it, when we merit it. He doesn't, you know, give us wisdom when we've taken time to perfectly craft and prepare that prayer for wisdom. Now, James says that God gives generously. And when he says that, he means that God's giving of wisdom to us, his supplying of help to us in our troubles, is not predicated upon our character, but upon his character. For he is generous. He says God gives generously because he's generous in character. And he gives without reproach. And without reproach means that God doesn't look with disapproval on you when you come to him and ask for help in your time of need. He doesn't give based upon your previous record. Oh, you're coming to me for wisdom now, but remember what you did yesterday? I think I'm going to have to hold out this time. Without reproach. So don't hesitate to ask God for wisdom when you need his wisdom. God is not going to withhold from you when you need it. What does Jesus say? Come to me. Does Jesus not say, come to me? Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Think about those words. Come to me. I will give you. Learn from me. You will find. God gives generously to all without reproach. That being said, I think for many of us, the hope of God's generosity and the willingness to give freely to us is oftentimes overshadowed by Jesus' or James' solemn warning in verses 6 through 8. What does he say at the beginning of verse 6? He says, but let him ask in faith 
with no doubting. And that's where you and I just kind of go, mm. <laughs> right? What does it mean to ask in faith? Well, faith, as we often rehearse together here, uh, is reliance. It's belief. It's trust. It's this settled trust and confidence in God based upon his character and his promises and who he has revealed himself to be in Scripture. And whereas faith is this deep trust or confidence in God on the basis of his character, doubt is the opposite. Doubt is uncertainty about God and wavering about who he is in his character. Did God really say? Did God really say that he would give generously? God will not really give generously. You see, the enemy always calls God's word and God's promises into question. He isolates us. He creates doubt. And when he creates doubt, he tempts. And when he has got you alone and he has created doubt and he tempts you, he attacks you to destroy you. Don't think that because you pray for wisdom and are tempted to wonder, will God really give? That therefore he will not give to you. Do you know what you say to that thought when it comes? You are not welcome here. That is not what God has said. God has said that he will give generously to me without reproach. And so when the doubt threatens, when it creeps, you say, no doubt, you are not welcome here. The writer of the Hebrews says that the righteous will live by faith. What is faith? Faith is mischaricatured in our culture today. Faith is not blind trust in God, despite all evidence to the contrary. Quite the opposite, actually. Faith is informed trust in God on the basis of his revealed word, on the basis of his revealed works, and on the basis of his disclosed character. Will I trust God or will I doubt God? That's the choice that we each have to make, isn't it? James says, the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. I'm not convinced James is actually describing believers here. The word that he uses, double-minded, literally means double-souled, double-lived. It's like someone with a spiritual split personality. That person, James says, should not expect wisdom from uh, Jesus because he doesn't really actually truly, at the end of the day, believe in Jesus. He's got no real kind of durable trust, abiding confidence in Jesus. Can you trust Jesus in your trials? Can you trust Jesus to give you wisdom when you need it? Do you believe that? Think about Job, who trusted God when all his friends mocked him, even when his wife taunted him, challenging him to curse God and die. Do you remember that? But we know that Satan couldn't even lift a finger against Job without God's explicit permission. Think about Joseph. Betrayed by his brothers, sold into slavery, taken to Egypt. It seemed, from a human perspective, like all was lost for him. But God. God was in control, was he not? Joseph had not somehow slipped through the grasp of God, through his divine hands. Later on, we see that when You know, when God brings Joseph's circumstance full circle, he says to his brothers, I think some of the most beautiful and powerful words in all of Scripture. He says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. And so I ask you again, can you trust the Lord's purposes even when you suffer? Can you trust the Lord to supply all that you need even when you suffer. Peter's words encourage us here. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, 
who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Last, Jesus transforms my hope. Jesus transforms my hope. Verse 9, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers with the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. The text takes an interesting turn here. So far this passage has dealt with trials and with wisdom and now James kind of suddenly turns his attention to the subject of wealth. So we should ask ourselves, what is the connection between trials and wisdom and wealth? Just think of how many trials are connected to money or the lack of it. Let's be honest. How many of us have thought, if only I had a little more money, this would all work out. better than any sermon illustration I could have prepared. (laughs) If only I had a little more money, then it would all be okay. If only I were rich, then I could get that treatment. I could get that representation that I need. I could afford the, insert your need here. I could pay all the bills and their bills too. It would all be okay. If only I were rich. James spends a lot of ink on these last three verses to convey that the rich man is not secure. His hope is not stable. It is not lasting. Indeed, James says it withers like the grass. It falls like the flower. It perishes like beauty. It is short-lived passing. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. These last three verses kind of flow out of, they're anchored to one imperative. As a matter of fact, in in the original text, it's the very first word of the paragraph. It's at the very beginning of verse 9. And it's a word that we don't use that frequently today. It feels a little antiquated. It's the word boast. Boast. What does it mean to boast? As James uses this word, to take pride in something, to glory in something, maybe even to brag about it. You boast in what you perceive yourself to be secure in. You boast in what you wear as a badge of honor. You boast in what you are confident of in what you hope in. James says, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. There's something that we need to occasionally be reminded about, and that is that Christianity, the gospel, and Jesus himself turns worldly values right on their heads. Scripture tells us, Jesus says that um, the humble will be exalted, and the exalted will be humbled. The Bible is a book of many great reversals, and one such reversal uh, eventually concerns the rich and the poor, the exalted and the lowly. The kingdom of God has come predominantly to those who are lowly in this life, to those who are poor, to those who by worldly standards are not remarkable, to those who are not impressive to the rest of the world, to, to the elites and to the successful well-accomplished and distinguished culturally. And conversely, Jesus says that most of those who have enjoyed great wealth and great privilege in this life will be shut out from the kingdom. We read passages about this, and it is both hopeful and sobering. Consider the parable of the rich man in Luke chapter 12. Luke records, And Jesus told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully, And he thought to himself, 
What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. Does that sound like a boast? But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. That man had a great business plan. That man had great land. That man had much wealth. But he was not wise. Notice, God calls him fool. Though he was very smart, very strategic, and very successful. It's the poor in this life that are invited into the riches of Christ. Christ who gives all wisdom to us generously. Who takes our trials and our sufferings and our difficulties and he redeems them graciously. That we would one day be perfected in our character lacking in nothing and made like him. When we face trials, when life is pressing in on us, our hope is not our hope is not in the material resources that we have at our disposal. Our hope, our boast, our confidence is in our high position in Christ. Let me ask you this question. Do you see what God has done for you in Christ as better than what you have saved up in your bank account? Or in your IRA? Or in your 401k? Or in your crypto wallet? Friends, as you go out from our gathering today, as you face your trials, face them head on. Face them with full hearts because you do not face your trials and your difficulties and your sufferings from a position of weakness or from a position of poverty, but from a position of riches. You do not face them from a lowly position, but from a high position. And just as it is counterintuitive, counterintuitive for us to you know, rejoice in our trials, so too we who are lowly in our circumstances should boast, we should express great confidence about our high position in Christ, in His generosity, in His willingness, in His kindness, in His goodness to supply all that we need as we face trouble. And for those of us who are wealthy, James says that we should check ourselves, that we should not hope in our wealth, for if we do, then it will bring a coming humiliation, which is certain. It will bring a great reversal, which is catastrophic. I don't know about you, but I would rather be a servant at the Lord's table than a king at my own. Think about Paul's words in the beginning of 1 Corinthians. For consider your calling, brothers, Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So, Jesus transforms our hope. Amen. Amen. We should conclude. 
As we conclude in thinking about what it means as Christians to persevere wisely through trials, I'd like to momentarily point us ahead to verse 12, which Pastor Andrew will skillfully, undoubtedly unpack for us next week in all of its glory and splendor. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. There's a great reward for persevering through our trials, amen? And this great reward should be a great comfort to us in the midst of them, amen? But notice Jane's final words, to those who love him. We Christians can say the best is yet to come, amen? But friend, if you're here today, and you're not a Christian, then I need to be uncomfortably honest with you. Scripture has no comfort for you in your trials. Biblically, you need to understand your trials best as only the beginning of your condemnation for rejecting God and your insistence on your own way. It is a hard truth, but it is a truth nonetheless. So for you, there's only the chilling and sobering warning reserved for any person outside of Christ that the worst is yet to come. But I'm here to tell you that that doesn't have to be. I'm here to tell you that you can flee from the wrath to come. And I'm here to tell you that you can flee to Christ. And if you flee to him, he will receive you. There's not a single person in this room that is a Christian who was born a Christian. Every single one of us had to be born again. Amen, church? Even those of us who were born into Christian homes like myself. Even those of us who heard scripture read to us early. The truth of the gospel shared with us early. Each and every one of us had to decide at some point to lay aside our self-lordship and to trust in Jesus Christ fully and to bend the knee. All of us at some point had to turn from our sins and turn to Christ. So, friend, if that is you, you can do that too. Pray. Pray that God would give you wisdom. Pray that God would help you to do that today, right now, this morning, before the Rams play the Bengals. (laughs) Church, what James is saying to us in our trials is simply this. Keep following Jesus. So I'm going to leave you with what Jesus did so you will know how to follow him. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus is Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank thank you for your word, which reveals to us the truth about you and your ways and the way we should go. Thank you for this great promise that you have made to us that you will redeem our suffering that you will help us when we ask and that you give us a hope that will never perish, that will never pass. Father, we pray that your word would abide richly in our hearts this morning, this afternoon, this evening, this week, this month, this year. Jesus, we turn our hearts now to remember your work. Amen.